have just joined and possibly some uh, audio issues. So there are two components to this, the phone call and then also the, uh, the screen that I'm sharing containing a PowerPoint. You should be able to see records management for the 21st century. If anyone is, uh, is missing any either of those, or if you can't see the screenshot, rather, then uh, let me know uh, in the chat box or on the phone, and we'll uh, we'll see what we can do to straighten things out. I think uh, we'll give it just another minute uh, before we get started. Trying to dial into a uh, webinar and not having it. Hi there. Uh, this is Matt. Um, let's see. We can. Um, did you try the 800 number that was on the um, meeting invitation? Um, yeah, and I just now am able to hear you. Before that, I was not able to at all. Okay. Okay. Great. Glad glad it's connecting now. Okay. I'll go ahead and mute myself then. Okay. Great. Is this Sid? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. You were. That was the only um, only last the last person that was reporting issues. So I'm glad that we're all all connected. We're all here. So we'll get go ahead and get started. Um, I am Matt, and my voice is a little froggy today. Uh. It happens a little, I guess, with the changing of the weather, whatever, but uh, I'm feeling fine, uh, ready to do our records management 101 training, records management for the 21st century. It is uh, State Archive's uh, basic training course, introductory training course. We have plenty of others, and since this uh, is Archives Month, we're ramping up our training offerings. There are plenty available on our website. I'm glad that uh, people are able to attend today, and this might spark interest in attending other uh, attending other training sessions. Most of them uh, are given by Stephanie Clark, who's my supervisor. She's the Information and Records Management Unit Supervisor. She uh, committed to a full slate of these uh, trainings and then asked me to sub in for this one. And I'm happy to do so and happy to answer any questions people have. Um, feel free to raise your hand virtually on the webinar or unmute yourself and, and ask your question and we'll, we can address it in real time. And we'll also leave time at the end for questions in case, in case, in case people have questions. All right. So this is, uh, a session where we talk about the basics of public records law, records management, and talk about what it means for uh, government employees. I noticed on the attendee list we've got state agency employees and also several from cities, um, counties, special districts, local government, and this, this presentation is meant for all of those audiences. All right, first of all, why should anyone worry about records management? It uh, tends to be a little bit dry, and I, I applaud your uh, coming to an early morning session about it. At the same time, it is ex an extremely important um, discipline. It is very, uh, it is really pretty impossible for anyone to do their job effectively as a public worker if they don't know and are carrying out uh, effectively the requirements expected of them under public record law. And so our records management training is intended to get people up to speed on uh, what is a public record, uh, how long do we keep them, uh, what are some possible solutions 
for keeping them, and we also talk about different challenges uh, to that, uh, mostly in the form of new technologies, social media, texting, instant messaging, uh, body cam footage, any of those things um, could cause serious uh, management issues for agencies in terms of resources and budget. So we want to make sure information is getting out there and people are um, following, following the steps so to protect themselves as individuals and also protect their employers um, from issues that can arise when it comes to poor records management. So poor records management harms the agency in a bunch of ways. Probably most notably, it costs a lot of money. If you're storing records in whatever form that don't need to be kept, it's going to be expensive. And it can all in that uh, improper storage or management of records can also mean legal issues for the agency um, in the form of litigation, in the form of when lawyers or courts or re reporters or the general public ask the agency for information and it can't be disclosed or it can't be found and disclosed, uh, then that those can often turn into even bigger issues, financial issues and also loss of public reputation. In fact, there are um, a number of cases where agencies have realized they don't have proper records management in place. And uh, rather than try to implement practices that would that would allow them to do it, they just choose to settle out of court. So they they pay off the people who ask for records. And guess what? That just guarantees more information requests and uh, more more financial settlements. So that's that's what we want to try to prevent is having spent a lot of time and resources that the agency probably doesn't have on this issue. Okay, so improper records management is also hard for employees. There have been studies that have found the average employee spends 25 to 40 percent of their workday, of their time at work, looking for information and not always finding it either. That boils down to two to three hours per day. Can you imagine how much more productive you'd be if you had two to three hours uh, back that you had, you were able to find information that you needed, didn't have to spend a lot of extra time looking for it, found what you needed, and were able to disclose it to the public or to coworkers uh, as necessary. So poor records management also leads to lots of duplicate copies being held on to. Um, agencies aren't sure that they can lay their hands on the information when they need it, so they squirrel away copies, paper, local drives, network drives, electronic form. So they're not sure what the official copy is. They don't know if they can get access to the information when they need it. And so they make lots of copies. And if you make 10 copies of something, it's going to cost you 10 times as much as it needs to to store that particular document than it really needs to. We want to store it once and then uh, have everyone know and trust that official copy. Okay, time to talk about the laws. Uh, I should I should tell everyone I am not an attorney. I do not have legal training. We just uh, talk about uh, the particular section of the law where it talks about public records and defines them. So public record uh, definition, it happens twice in the Oregon Revised Statutes in 192. And it's defined two places. Once is for purposes of retention. That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, is it a public record? How long do you keep the public record? How do you keep the public record? And that's this definition on your screen. Uh, a, B, and C, it has to meet all three criteria for it to be considered a public record for the purposes of retention. So it's kind of legalese, but the um, it boils down to is it work-related? And at the bottom, it states every public agency needs to maintain this public record or a copy of in accordance with a retention schedule. The retention schedule needs to be authorized by Secretary of State Archives. 
and retention schedules are independent of the technology or medium used to create or store the file or record. And so just because something is a public, hmm. all right, it sounds like the slides are not advancing to, to keep up with my presentation. Let's see if I can address that. All right, everyone should be seeing a slide that says know the laws. Is everyone seeing that? Okay. Huh, that's funny. It was not keeping up when it was in a large screen mode. And split screen mode seems to work. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for uh, speaking up on the chat and letting me know. Okay, here we go. I'll just advance this way here. So here are the A, B, and C that our information has to meet all three criteria in order to be considered a public record. Um, kind of a lot. <laughs> you can look it up in the ORS 192, but kind of boils down to, is it in tangible form, something you can touch or see, and re recorded information? And does it relate to public business? There are a few exemptions to that, but for the most part, if it meets these three criteria, the agency should consider it a public record and not destroy it without reference to a retention schedule approved by state archives. Okay. Um, and the definition changed several years ago to keep up with technology. Um, the list of possible formats that public records can be kept in is always growing, grows every day. And rather than try to keep up with all those types of formats and media, we wrote a general um, definition so that people can say this record is prepared by the agency or appears on our website even or appears on a social media site. That would be an official capacity, that would be a public record. It relates to the functions or mandates of the agency, then it, it should be kept according to retention schedule and not and not destroyed until that retention period is met. So that is the definition for uh, purposes of retention. What I what I'm not able to talk to you about today is the other uh, the other definition of public record that is issued by Oregon Department of Justice. And DOJ oversees the part of public records law relating to access or disclosure of public records. A reporter shows up and says, I want to see this particular record, uh, and you want to know whether you should disclose it, that's when you contact either your local attorney or uh, Department of Justice. And um, there are many, many exemptions to what needs to be disclosed, although the law is slanted towards the disclosure. There are some important uh, exceptions to that, and the lawyers can help walk you through uh, whether that applies. There, there are a number of gray areas um, that archives can help you with. But if it's related to retention, we'll be happy to work with you and help you out. OK, um, last slide about the law, public meetings law is Oregon's uh, Government in the Sunshine Act um, so that public decisions are arrived at openly and the public has a does have a right to know uh, what its representatives are doing. So that's where um, city councils that meet, boards and commissions that meet, um, that is one of the few times when uh, a public record needs to be created by law. Um, the minutes meeting minutes need to be uh, retained as evidence of top-level decision-making. Most of the rest of the time, aside from public meeting minutes, there's no requirement that a document or a record be created if it doesn't already result from your routine business processes. If uh, records do result, then in whatever form, then they should be listed in a retention schedule so that you uh, can eventually destroy them. And probably 98% of records will have retention periods. They can be eventually destroyed, although you know they range from you know, 30 days 
up into uh, 150 years. And, and some records are even longer. They have permanent value. And most public meeting minutes, agendas, and exhibits do have permanent retention. The goal is transparency. And that's why we want to do a good job of managing records is so that not only internal employees, but also the public can uh, have access to important government information. OK, so the laws we've been talking about apply to public records created anywhere, created on any device uh, that is owned by either the agency or the private individual, uh, private accounts and private devices, they're all subject to public records law. Uh, it makes no distinction uh, between who created it, uh, or rather who, who bought the information, who bought the uh, device that it was created on, or where it is stored. It's not the case that the public records law stops at your, the door of your agency's headquarters. If that work is taken home and worked on at home, or transmitted on private devices outside the building, it doesn't matter. The content is the only thing that determines whether something is public record or not. So that's why we strongly recommend and they were needed as evidence. So um, public records law is very broad. It's interpreted broadly, and uh, we want to want to stay on the right side of that. Whenever possible, we try not to commingle our private and our public records. I know sometimes that's difficult. But um, when, we record, when we record information, especially in a government system, if it's work-related, it, we have to assume that someone might ask for it and that we would have to disclose it unless there is a specific exemption uh, listed in the law. It also doesn't matter um, the uh, technology or format or storage media that it exists in is unimportant. It's only content that matters just because these formats are so interchangeable and change all the time. It's in PDF and then you print it out and you got a piece of paper. The content doesn't change. And so the retention doesn't change either. Okay, here's a slide containing some of the um, additions to our OAR that we made recently. And it just brought, brought archives rules, um, uh, made them updated to allow for certain instances of the official copy of long-term records to be held not just in paper or microfilm, that was, that was the old rule. Uh, there is a possibility for them, the long-term records, to be held in electronic form. There's still a bunch of hoops to jump through before that can happen, though. And um, we're happy to talk about any, any of those. People have questions about that. These apply basically to your permanent records, your uh, top-level meeting records. Uh, meeting minutes, um, records that maybe maybe of environmental damage that have an extremely long retention period based on uh, long-term uh, environmental pollution, things like that. Most other records, uh, it is acceptable for them to live their life cycles in electronic form, but the agency um, does need to make sure that you know if it's a 20-year retention period that the format or storage media that they're using to retain that information is going to be retrievable and accessible for at least 20 years. In an electronic form, that can be tricky. That can be very tricky because flash drives, CDs, DVDs have longevity in less than 10 years. So we, we're very leery of um, keeping records long with retention periods longer than 10 years on um, uh, electronic media such as those. Okay, um, 
how do agencies want to comply with public records law? Um, the second bullet we already talked about, uh, an authorized retention schedule. And uh, everyone listening to this today does have a general schedule that applies to them. Those are contained in Oregon Administrative Rule 166. So I know that there are the sheriff's office, there are city recorders on the call. So check uh, OAR 166, and then you'll see the subdivisions for each kind of level of uh, agency, uh, state, local, and then that will bring you up your your specific uh, general the general schedule that applies to your agency. Uh, first bullet. It's very important for every agency to prioritize this kind of work by issuing policy and procedure, uh, preferably from the top level, that make it a priority. And um, at least in my experience, our, my agency takes it very seriously. Um, my first day on the job, I received training on certain issues, acceptable use of computers, management of public records, um, we watched videos, we had training sessions, and at the end, uh, I signed a statement that I would abide by those, by those policies, and we received refresher training. So, in that in that sense, my agency is doing a good job of protecting itself because, well, we're the state archives, we're, we're supposed to be responsible for public records, but um, every agency can follow that example, and we have uh, training materials that we can share related to that. If one individual um, improperly manages records, um, it depends on whether the agency trained them and had an expectation of what they were supposed to do in the form of written policy and procedure. If the agency did not, then the agency itself is in serious uh, uh, difficulty. If the agency did and the employee just had gone rogue, signed the statement and then disregarded it, then it's the employee, individual employee uh, that's going to be on the hook. And then finally, it's not enough to just have an authorized retention schedule. It also has to be applied routinely by HC employees. OK, I have mentioned official copy of a record, but I think it's important to address that a little more. The official copy is the one copy designated by the agency to be kept for retention purposes. Because you know, we can all think of examples. Like, I'll send an email to three people. Now, all, all of us don't have an official copy. My agency designates uh, only one of them. And well, my agency specifies, in most cases, the sender, the internal sender of an email or direct message is the official copy holder and needs to retain it. Um, it's expensive to store records, like I mentioned. There's a lot of legal liability if the retention schedules aren't followed. We want to minimize duplicate records. So other duplicates of the email that I sent are classified as convenience copies. We recommend convenience copies be destroyed really as soon as practicable, and, but they need to be destroyed at the time that the official copy is destroyed. So people don't always know when that happens. So it's best to routinely identify non-record or a convenience copy or duplicate information in whatever form we find it and get rid of it. The example I like to give is my employee timesheet. I fill it out once a month. I don't keep copies around just because I know I can always get it from my HR shop. They hold the official copy, not my division. All right, let's talk a little bit about retention schedules. Retention is uh, just uh, a list of retention schedules or a list of documents or file types. Sometimes there are descriptions. And then a retention period for each type of document or record. Again, this is determined only by the content, what is the information that's contained and it's not any other consideration, such as the form that it's in, whether it's confidential or restricted. Th those have nothing to do with uh, how long something should be kept. 
the retention schedule is every agency's legal authorization to destroy their public records. That's the only uh, citation you need to rely on. We do issue these retention schedules in collaboration with agencies. Uh, so we want to get their input, make sure we have the retentions right before we make them official. Um, and again, the schedule simply states how long records should be maintained if they are created in the first place. It doesn't create an additional requirement for anyone to start generating or creating a record that they don't already create. Okay, so general schedule, we talked about OARs, 166, and this is one example. I know there are some cities in attendance, and this is a list from the city's general schedule. So it's got uh, headings in this example at the bottom, half, halfway down, there's accounting, uh, the, and then the subset of bonds. So there are different types of retention periods for records related to bonds. And this lists, lists them out, lists the citation, and that is your agency's legal authority to destroy bond records after, after a certain period of time has elapsed. We want the retention periods to be nice and clear so that they can be easily followed by, by anyone who holds these records and, and uh, wants to comply with retention schedules when uh, carrying out the destruction. Okay. For years, we've gotten lots of questions about email. It's always been the huge gorilla in the room when it comes to, well, most people, most people get a lot of their information this way. And email programs such as Outlook were never intended to be long-term uh, pub public records management um, techniques. The best thing is for them to be offloaded into another system or printed out as, as, as little as we don't really want to do that either, but there are some cases when printing out um, electronic files to paper um, might make sense. Although there are more options now for electronic storage. And the, the next slides I'm going to talk about all have to do with changing technologies. And that's where a lot of our change, challenges related to public records come from these days. All right, so email, the, the volume has exploded. <laughs> it, it seems to double every other year now. Yeah, it's At the same time, it's pretty much a vital tool in how we all work and how we can communicate and transmit public records. Another issue is there's no simple retention for email. Again, any email's retention depends on the content of that particular email. So um, there have been cases where agencies thought that they could slap 30 or 60 day retention periods on all email across the boards. They were slapped down pretty hard for that. Um, the unit of record that we're talking about is the email message itself. So if you have a thousand emails in your inbox, you pretty much need to classify all of them and put and file them for the appropriate retention period. You can't just say, oh, they're all more than 60 days old and get rid of them. As tempting as that is sometimes, um, we still need to follow uh, procedures for retention schedules. Also, attachments to emails can be considered public records too, and, and they should be filed along with the email message that transmitted them in those cases. It's really difficult to sort and handle ma uh, email in a practical way just because there's so much of it and it's very complex and the retention periods are all over the place. All right, let's go to the next slide. Over the decades of managing email, we've, we've learned a few things and practical approaches to email. First, you know, we want it, we want our guidance to be simple. The less manual sorting and filing that you make people do, the more likely they are to actually follow it. Um, also, we're um, working on issues of um, that email sent and received as part of your job. 
the retentions can be, in a large sense, predicted by what the position is, what your duties are, and the records that we routinely touch as part of those duties. So directors, in most cases, have will have longer retentions than their uh, than the subordinates, but that's that's not always the case. It's a kind of a balancing act. Uh, how do we want to retain emails? Um, we would retain it based on the position of the person in question. We're working on, our agency has been working on these types of issues. There's no um, solid solution to this yet, but we do hope to, to kind of simplify how our retention sch schedules work and uh, have fewer categories so that people can, you know, sort things into a manageable number of uh, retention periods. When it comes to uh, case files, uh, project files, contracts and agreements, that's one case where it's really best to have a specific folder named for that uh, contract or case name and then to dump email into that folder and then it's all retained together and then it becomes a lot easier to sort it later. You can apply retentions uh, at the folder level uh, with the proper system. One of the things we've talked about with email include we want to train employees on what types of email they don't have to keep because the majority of an inbox is probably going to be work related but always going to be stuff that flips through spam filters and other things that just aren't considered public record and don't need to be managed. So the screen lists a couple of those examples here. Advertisements, lists of messages that you don't reply to, unsolicited messages, including spam. Uh, people in my office like to cook, so they'll, they'll say, send an email hey, there's a cake or donuts at the break, you know, and we appreciate that. Um, at the same time, we don't need to have, have those kinds of emails that clog it up our email box. So we recognize those are not really work-related. Uh, they don't relate to the function of the agency, so we can purge those. Also, personal correspondence. If it is in your email, in your work email, um, we can delete both what the sender sent us and any personal replies that we send back. If, it's, if it doesn't touch on public business, that is. Um, articles and reference materials, news clippings that refer to a city or a county or sheriff's office, those are not specifically public records just because an agency was mentioned. Uh, those can be purged. And also CCs. If I'm just included on a message for my information and I'm not expected to act on it, I'll read that email and then I'll delete it. Uh, most likely the sender is going to have the official copy of that and retain it. It does help us to have very specific subject lines that describe what is in, the, what content is included in the email. Um, we might send a, a message saying the subject line might be today, and that might make sense to us at that moment, but in six months, are we going to have any idea how to classify that email with the subject line today? Probably not. We need to give it a more descriptive subject line. Uh, like I mentioned, my agency does have a uh, policy of the sender keeps the official copy. And if someone from outside the agency sends it to me and I'm the recipient, then in that case, I'm also the official copy holder. Uh, I'm the only one in my agency who can, who can file that. One of the things that um, the State Archivist uh, has found and is, and is approving of is if people use Outlook uh, from 2010 or a uh, more recent version of Outlook, is the Outlook Cleanup tool. And um, you should be able to see this little icon on your screen, the Cleanup button. What it does is it purges um, duplicate emails from, your, from, um, from Outlook. It condenses it so that only the, the final response in the thread, the one with all the previously quoted metadata and content, is going to be retained. I go back and forth with a content uh, email uh, colleague uh, 10 times. I don't need to keep all 10 versions of that. 
because Outlook is keeping track of who said what and when. And so the, the tenth email message is the only one you really need to keep. So Outlook is good at um, doing things like figuring out which were the, the nine previous versions of this email and deleting those, knowing that you're not throwing out any unique content because it's all captured in the tenth email. <laughs> Excuse me. All unique content is captured. The only time you need to be concerned, though, is if on the second email go around, someone included an attachment. Well, when you reply for the next time, it's not going to. I mean, it's not going to keep sending that attachment back and forth to the email every single time. So you would want to make sure that you weren't uh, destroying any attachments when you use the cleanup tool. But it is something that we found uh, very helpful uh, with those those considerations in mind. Can save us time and and free up our inbox. All right, next topic is something that's been exploding in public agencies is social media and mobile. And we think of this as new technology, but the records being transmitted are basically the same, and the old rules still apply. We just have a couple of tweaks that we want people to be aware of when it comes to managing those. First of all, social media content can be public record. And I'm defining public record uh, or social media as pretty much third party platforms, usually web based, Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, Tumblr, YouTube, all of that. So when we sign up for those things, we sign in terms of service. They, that means, usually means they're free, but it also means that that company retains ownership of things that are posted there. And in our experience, Unfortunately, uh, companies like Google and Facebook don't really care about the public records law in Oregon, and they aren't going to help you um, uh, discover information, retrieve information. Um, we need to do a good job of keeping it ourselves and just using Google, Facebook, and Twitter as distribution channels for records that we already have the official copy of under our control at the agency. So we ask the same questions about social media content being a public record. Number one, is it used to conduct agency business? And B, is the content unique? The answer to both is yes. Then that should be managed as a public record. The agency needs to have written policies and procedures that address uh, records use, records access, records retention, and records ownership. Uh, like we were saying earlier, and in the case of social media, there's a couple a couple choices for trying to retain that information uh, within an agency's control. First of all, a lot of uh, platforms have built-in mechanisms like Twitter and Facebook both have places where you can say, download to my computer all of my activity on these sites, which is nice. Um, there are also um, software tools that will uh, capture to capture locally everything sent to a social media site. So those are kind of your main uh, options are either address it in policy or address it through software tools. Okay, so following on uh, social media, there's mobile devices, text messages, text messaging apps, direct messages. So the question of who holds these records is it's probably not the agency. Um, if I if I send a text message on my phone, it's probably held on Verizon servers. It's a third party provider. It doesn't go through my agency's IT network. So that's the main issue there is an issue of control. So that entity uh, that has the information, in this case Verizon, how long does it retain that information? They might not even have a clear idea of that. It's definitely going to be a lot shorter than our retention periods. They keep it on their servers for a short period of time and then it's purged. And that's why um, at the moment for text messages, state archives guidance is um, to have a short boilerplate policy 
that staff are instructed not not to conduct substantive business related communications via text messaging, SMS, or any other mobile messaging app just for that reason that they aren't uh, naturally captured on servers within the agency's control. They're out there in the cloud somewhere. I mean, I have been known to use text messages, but usually it's to text a colleague, uh, I'm going to be 10 minutes late to the meeting. Or uh, here's the address that we're meeting at. We don't consider those terribly substantive. And so um, any substantive or serious work communications we'd conduct probably on email because we know that's captured on our agency servers. So going beyond all these technologies, which we all uh, have heard of and, and use pretty much every day, there's all kinds of other technology, uh, communications technologies on the horizon. Some of them are closer than others. Uh, voice over IP, which can capture uh, telephone communications. Uh, Snapchat has additional challenges because uh, by definition, their messages self-destruct and so make it very hard to manage according to retention schedules. A lot of agencies have started to create, um, uh, for example, police body cam videos and the storage issues that can come along with that. And also drones. Drones can capture all kinds of footage. Um, so we want to make sure that, that whatever technologies are coming down the pike that are our retention schedules and our policies and procedures are, can be updated to, to accommodate those. It's always important to ask, you know, especially in the case of body cams and drones footage, we want to ask what's the purpose of this recording? What function is it fulfilling? If it's being used as evidence for a current or pending investigation, that uh, there might be you know, some reasons that are a lot more reasonable than, than others. Than just, well, we can create the records, and so we are. Uh, we want to take into account also the cost of uh, the devices and also of the, the storage that could result, because these can be huge files for drones and body cams. But we expect that those uh, emerging technologies records are going to uh, be the same retention period as other similar listed items in the schedule. We don't anticipate having to change our retention periods just because a new technology is uh, taking over email or taking over from text messages. It's all based on content of, of the information. And the information had probably fills the same function as it did before, before the technology existed. Um, so the takeaways that I, that I hope people will uh, have from this meeting uh, just a couple quick bullet points. We want people to understand that storing information is not the same as measuring the information. Uh, we might have a file room that's comprehensive and has every piece of communication that's gone through the agency in the last 20 years. But unless we have a good way to manage it and to retrieve what we need out of that huge uh, file room, um, we're not doing a good job of, we're not being good stewards of our information. We need to not just stockpile it, but also have intellectual control over it and uh, be able to get what we need from it in a reasonable time period. Okay, second bullet is it's extremely important for everyone at the agency to know and understand the retention schedule that applies. Most of the time the general schedule in OAR 166 is going to be sufficient, but if uh, if there are gaps, and that does sometimes happen, if records exist that aren't covered by that, we'll, we'll definitely talk with you and, and see if we can issue uh, a, a special retention period for those records. Um, I can't stress highly enough the importance of written agency policies and procedures issued from the top uh, that address how important it is for employees to uh, be aware of the law and follow the law to comply with best practices and procedures to uh, protect protect themselves and to protect the agency. And then last bullet point is 
you know, everyone talks about uh, new information systems, new ways of storing our information, and uh, our point is that these discussions are uh, not should not be limited to one particular department. That there are several departments that really need to be involved. Um, for example, IT shops, of course, uh, play a role in determining um, records keeping technologies and trans records transmission technologies. But also, it's important for administration to be involved, for legal to be involved, and any records management employees, um, including for at cities, the city recorders are the de facto records officers, and at the counties, it's the county clerks. So it's important to have them be part of the discussion too, so that they're all involved in discussions uh, about acquiring new information systems or new systems that will hold public records. That's the end of my slides. Uh, I wanted to leave some of this uh, contact information up. Any questions related to today's presentation or records management in Oregon in general can go to this, um, can send them to this email, records management. Um, then Chris Stenson uh, works at my office. He is the administrator for ORMS, which is our uh, electronic records management system solution. It's a government-based cloud, essentially, and he's happy to talk to people who want to hear more about those kinds of solutions. And then finally, I'm listing the DOJ uh, contact. He's great for questions about disclosure of records, access to records, and um, I believe he works mostly with state agencies, but he might entertain questions from others as well. Uh, for local agencies, your best bet might be your uh, council attorneys at your at your city. Okay. Um, I will take questions on the phone. I do see that there are a couple questions sent via chat, um, and I'll try to address those real quickly. Okay, what is our responsibility regarding comments posted by non-employees on social media accounts? That's a good question. So the any agency should have a policy that addresses comments left by the public. Um, it's not a great idea to wipe those comments unless um, they're threatening uh, or harassment. It's good to lay out the reasons that a comment on an agency social media platform would be deleted. But um, those comments probably would not want to rely on Facebook, for example, to retain them. You'd probably want to keep a local copy um, somehow, just like you would the information that you posted, you'd want to keep the comments as well. And it it would probably be a good idea for um, direct replies to comments, like if someone says, well, hey, your public works department didn't fix this pothole on my street. Um, it would be best to have the public works department follow up with them, not on the Facebook site, but by email, so that all that correspondence is conducted on agency servers within your control. Uh, and also, Follow up. What about if the individual, if the individual deletes that comment? I guess it would depend on how often your agency was uh, refreshing its um, was uh, retaining comments posted on that. I, I don't think I would worry too much about that. If someone posted something immediately and immediately deleted it, um, and then uh, if we need to delete comments for violating our guidelines, right. So as long as you have guidelines in place and um, agency employees aren't deleting comments willy-nilly, they're um, deleting them according to um, agency policy, then, then you should be fine. Uh, the next question was, do you have this presentation posted online? You know, I'm not sure this exact one is. Let me, let me do a real quick check. Uh, State Archives does have a training and education site where we do have presentation. Uh, let's see if it's up. Yes. I will put in the chat box a URL that may not be precisely exactly the same, but it's pretty close. 
And if you click on that link, oops, I'm afraid I set that privately. Let me send it to the entire, entire group. All right, so you should see in your chat box a link to uh, our Oregon Public Records Law Training um, that does have today's slides. And contact me with any questions. Um, and then let's see, there's another question. Are, are comments to social media platforms public record because they are on our page? Uh, it's a little bit of a gray area. I think, yes, basically, if um, a public agency is posting, posting information publicly, it might fall under the same requirements as, you know, regular public comments or public notice, um, especially if it's, uh, if it's work-related, related to uh, comments, pro or con. Uh, what's being posted on the agency's page, and it's it's kind of uh, you know having an agency have an official Facebook or Twitter account um, does encourage the public to leave comments. So yes, um, I think on some platforms comments can be disabled, but a lot of agencies do want to have that interaction between the public and the agency, so they they do enable comments and they do have means to capture. Uh, information that is sent by the public to those on those uh, comments on those uh, commented on on agencies pages. Uh, okay, so I think that was the end. Yes, this comment is right on point, Bill. The agency does have to retain comments, even even if they're offline in um, different states and federal agencies have had to pay up for not retaining copies um, of posts. So uh, that's another another argument for having a mechanism that automatically captures um, what it, what an agency transmits to social media and what the public comments on, on it as well. Good point. OK, so I think I made it through the um, comments posted so far on the chat bar. If anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, um, that would be fine as well. Or you can type more in the chat box. All right, does, does anyone have anything else? Otherwise, we can uh, wrap up a little bit early. Uh, let me know if people have questions or um, follow-ups. The presentation slides, we, we do recommend people can um, download those and, and give those themselves. Uh, send those around, circulate them so that uh, everyone's on the same page when it comes to our guidance uh, related to public records. But unless there's anything else, uh, I will Thank you all for your time. Thanks for putting up with my scratchy voice. Uh, I hope it was helpful. And uh, feel free to contact us at State Archives if we can be of any assistance at all. All right, thanks, everyone. Have a good day.